quite some time. But tonight, like I said, I'm going to be sharing on why God would bless us. We are blessed to be a blessing. And even with regards to the local church and um, our, our membership here and, and, and the way we serve and the way we are, we've got to see the church God has placed us in as our plug into the kingdom of God. Did you, did you catch that? We've got to see the church, the local church, the body that God has placed us in as our plug into the kingdom of God. It is, um, it's necessary, it's crucial to what God is doing on this earth. I didn't just say that the church was perfect. I didn't just say that, that, that um, you know, it was without issue. But I did say that what I am getting at is that you are perfectly placed in the body of Christ where you belong. And while there may be times where the Lord would maneuver and shift you out of a season, out of even even out of a, a particular congregation, in a place where God is moving and active and where the word of God and Jesus Christ is being lifted up, you're not just going to move because your feelings are hurt. And so you must see, or you're not just going to move or, or back away because you're bored or because you're tired or you're struggling or whatever the case may be. You must see the church as your plug into the kingdom of God. The question for you then is, are you not excited for church? Does church not stir you? And the thing is, it's not because the preacher is not a good preacher. It's not because... Um, it, it, it can't be because of the way things are, are, are going on in the church or what's going on in the church, but it's got to be because of the fact that, well, here's the thing. If the church is your plug into the kingdom, the question comes, how excited are you for the church? How excited are you for the kingdom of God? Do you care about the kingdom of God? Do the things that concern God, do they concern you? Are they, are, are they of any concern? Are they of any value to you? Because here's the deal, I'll tell you this, even as I bring correction and instruction, the reason that I would bring correction and instruction is not because I'm trying to correct you out the door, but I'm trying to maybe correct that spirit out the door, or maybe bring that stronghold down in agreement with you, but because you are perfectly placed, I desire that you would be perfectly placed with in perfect operation of the gift that God has created you to be to this body. Am I making sense? Am I speaking English this evening? You're meant to be perfectly placed in this body. And so if you're not excited about the church, like I said, it can't, it can't be because, you know, the preacher's not preaching so good or I don't like what he's talking about. But understand there's a reason for everything that's going on. Lately I've been doing a lot of teaching and so I feel like there's, there's something shifting in me and something shifting in the way that I minister. But that's okay. But again, if you're not excited for the church, well, then how excited are you for the kingdom of God? Because this is where God has placed you, and this is where God wants to maneuver you into where, and not just you even, but everybody around you, everybody that's a part of this ministry and everybody that's a part of this church. He wants to maneuver you into the kingdom, into where you're being effective, into where you're having an impact. Part of that for us is we get to be a part of the Safe Haven Network. Part of that for us is we're out here reaching people. We got to go out with the Trevinos a couple weeks back. We've been out as a church with, uh, you know, we, we went out uh, down the street and up to the, a few of our spots. And we've been out doing things. This year we will be out. I'm looking to go out maybe on Tuesday nights or Wednesday nights and hit the Columbine projects over here because the Lord has really placed them in my heart. I've been driving by there praying a lot. But the thing is, is if you're not excited for the kingdom of God, how will you ever be excited for your church? Come on, come on. Here's the thing. So let's say, let, let's just put it this way. Let's say you're going on a vacation. You have a destination. You're going to, what's the worst place anyone would want to go? I don't know. No, I like to go anywhere. What'd you say? I don't know, bro. I don't know any better. I get excited going anywhere. But let's say this destination is not a place you want to go. Let's say you don't care about going there. Well, how excited are you going to be for getting in the car to go there? How excited are you going to be getting on the plane or the train or the automobile to get there? See, it's the same thing. This church is the vehicle by which God wants to propel you into the kingdom, set you into the kingdom. Part of the reason for the, for the mission statement of this church, which is to reach 
to disciple and to raise up is because that's part of being the vehicle to get you into the place in the kingdom of God that you're meant to be in, that you're meant to operate in. Can somebody say amen? Because somebody should want to be where God wants them to be in the kingdom of God. And that, my brothers and my sisters, is why it hurts me to see people step away. Not because I need them here. I don't, if, if God intends for there to be a dozen people here, I'm good with it. But I've encountered a lot more than a dozen people that belong here, even if it's just for a season. And what hurts me and what breaks my heart about people stepping away is not because I need them here, but my question is, what are they stepping into? Are they really, have they really prayed and sought God's plan? And has God really moved them along? Or are they just ticked off at me? And if cream puffs listen, she don't let me say nothing else. But sometimes I know I got people, you know, people have given me the bird as they go. And then some people, have, you know, this and that. And, uh, you know, a lot of different things. But that's what hurts me. Not because of even the way people leave. Like, here's the deal. I've not been happy with people even in this room right now. But I'm okay. Like, I, I, I pray we've forgiven each other and we're past it. And yes, Lord, you've been on my last. I'm just kidding. <laughs> but, but the thing is, is we don't move on. We don't step back. We don't draw back because things aren't interesting. Things aren't right because so-and-so, because this, because that. The key to being in the blessing of God, in order to plug in the blessing of God, we must plug into the kingdom. And your plug into the kingdom is the, his church. And for us, that is this church. His church, and here's the deal. Now we're getting to the teaching. His church is about his people. I've told many of you, you don't need to love everybody on the face of the earth. Only the ones Jesus died for. So you, you know what I mean? You don't, I, like you can, you, you don't, no, yeah, yes, only the ones Jesus, thank you sister. Only the ones Jesus did not die for. You, those are the only ones you don't have to love. You, you got to love everybody Jesus died for. So if you find someone Jesus didn't die for, like your 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 the obligation's done. So tonight we talk about plugging into the blessing by caring for God's people. Because the reason God would bless us is so that we would be a blessing to one another. When you look at, whenever you're going to study a subject in the Bible, one of the good ways to go about it is by looking in the first place and, and, and the beginning of where God begins to mention the person, the place, or what you're studying. So today as I was looking at this, in the past couple of days as I was looking at this, I was looking at the blessing and where is the first place that God mentions the blessing? The first place that God mentions being blessed in the Bible is in Genesis chapter 1. And in Genesis chapter 1, verse 22, he actually, here's the thing, a lot of times we got the blessing messed up. Because we think the blessing is getting more things. And, and, and you know what? We can be blessed in that way. We can be blessed materially. But ultimately, when we are blessed, and it is the blessing of God, for one, the Bible says, it adds no sorrow to it. And the next thing, when it is the blessing of God, it is about multiplication, increase, and expanding. Come on, somebody. The Bible tells us in Genesis chapter 1, verse 22, and literally, he's talking about the animals at this point. He's speaking to the animals, but it's the first place that ble being blessed gets mentioned. And so Genesis chapter 1, and verse 22 tells us, and God blessed them, saying, be fruitful and multiply, and fill the waters of the seas, and let the birds multiply on the earth. In other words, the first place we see the blessing of God being pronounced upon anything is when it is a blessing upon creation for the purpose of being fruitful and multiplying. In other words, creating like uh, uh, it, 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 the, the harvest tells us, or actually a little bit later in Genesis, it tells us that each seed or each kind will produce like fruit or like species. So that blows evolution out of the water. That's a whole other preaching. But are you with me right now? I'm talking about getting blessed in the kingdom of God. And God blessed them and saying, and we want you to know he's talking to the animals. The animals don't care about the latest iPhone. The animals don't care about the biggest house or the most houses or this or that or this or that. The, here's the thing. When you're truly blessed of God, nice things are like the fourth thing on the list or the tenth thing on the list. Are you with me? When God blesses you, you will have nice things. At the, you know what I mean? It's kind of a symptom. 
Like when we get a cold, we sneeze, we cough, we headache and all that. Those are the symptoms. What's problem is there's a virus or a bug inside of us that's not meant to be there and that's causing us to be sick. Well, just like that, when you're blessed of God, you know what? Things are not your priority. They just kind of happen. And if they don't happen, it's not a big deal because your joy, your peace, your victory is not tied to material things or tied to this earth. Understand right here, the first time God blesses something, he blesses it to go forward, be fruitful, and multiply. A couple of months ago, I preached a message, and I said it's not about prosperity, but it is about posterity. Posterity being those that come after you, those that are after my life, those that... A generation and three and four generations later, the thing that God spoke blessing on was so that they would be fruitful and multiply. The next place, you know, there, there's quite a few more blessings, and they talk about this increase. But the next blessing we see that kind of jumps us ahead to where we are right now is in Genesis chapter 12 and verse 2. And God tells Abraham, I will make you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great, and you shall be a blessing. In other words, the reason that God will bless a people is so that they can be a blessing to somebody else. He does not bless a people so that they can live in comfort. He does not bless a people with the sole purpose of becoming billionaires and living in mansions and not having problems and being able to afford the best lawyers and the best situations and the best circumstances. God blesses a people so that those people can be fruitful and multiply. Come on. I'm preaching tonight. Can somebody say amen? Thank you, Jesus. And as lately, Dave, I need another one of these, please. You just give me the bottle. It excites me to know that just because I don't have a bunch of things that many people got more stuff than me, that I, I'm not stopped from being a blessing. It excites me to know that God would. Here's the thing is, is like sometimes, like, I, I, I'm, I don't know, Sunday I may be talking about the fear of the Lord. To some people that's a four-letter F word in the kingdom, but it's, it's going to be one of the greatest words you'll ever know if you, if you stand up and you, if you show up, rather, and receive it on Sunday. But here's the thing. I know that God is a, is a God that I need to fear. I know that God is a God that loves me. I know that he is working all things for my good. I know that God is a God that will bless. But here's the thing. When I start to realize sometimes it's hard for me to understand why he would bless or how he would bless. Praise God. In other words, the blessing has very little to do with us. And so understanding, like, why would you bless me? What is the purpose behind you blessing me? And, and, and the reason that he would bless us, he says it right here in Genesis chapter 12, verse 2. He says I will bless you and make your name great, and you shall be a blessing. Elsewhere, when God talks about the blessing, the blessing is that we would be the lender and not the borrower. Amen. Come on, somebody. That's good stuff right there. Amen. Amen. He blesses us to be the lender and not the borrower. Amen. But the deal is, you've got to see that God blesses us, and the key to God's blessing has to do with others has to do with what comes after us. Come on, I'm gonna, I'm, as, as I talked today, I mentioned earlier, the, the, the recent shooting in the, in, in the school in Highlands Ranch, that is a, that's a tragedy. Mm -hmm. But you know what, we are living in a day where our younger children, you know, my grandchildren are probably, I, matter of fact, I think I hope that they go to schools where there's metal detectors. Yeah. Because it doesn't matter where I send them. But even before I send them to a school with a metal detector, I'm going to tell you something. I've got to speak life. I've got to speak about God, about the God that can save them. Because this isn't all there is. Because there's a young man that is a hero at this point, according to my standards and according to, to, to where we are. This young man's a hero. He, he, he sacrificed his own life. But my prayer is, Lord, I just hope you meet him. Because no good deed gets us into heaven apart from Jesus. That's right. And so here's the thing is, is it, are our children, are our grandchildren, are they going to know about Jesus? Is this neighborhood going to know about Jesus? You know what, I'll tell you, I've seen the Lord has a way of working it out. People don't want to invest in this ministry and then, or, or not even just invest in this ministry or still in this ministry. But I've had people mock me coming into the ministry. 
that in the course of time, can you come? Can you can you go to court with me? Can you go to court with my children? Can you go to jail with my, for my for my son, for my daughter, my niece, my nephew? Can you? And, and you know what? I do it. I do it. But the thing is, you know what? I want you to understand. Like, there's no getting out of of doing what God has called you to do. Eventually, there's going to come a time where God is going to call you to be a blessing. And not just a blessing where you're shelling out a couple of bucks, but creating something, an opportunity, and an atmosphere for people to encounter God and know who He is. And God so cares about the blessing. God so cares about, about the, the reason that he cares about the blessing is not because he likes to see you shine so much. Because a lot of us, when we start shining, we start tripping. But it's because he wants us to be fruitful and multiply. Yes, amen. And the thing about being plugged into the church and then realizing the church is about people. And not just you and your people, but about all these people around us and about a bunch of people that you know that belong here that you can't even stand. And that's what it's about. It's about God's people. Go with me to the book of Matthew chapter 18. We're going to hit on a bunch of verses and we're going to get to this altar tonight because here's the deal is we are never going to live in a, in a, in a more peaceful time <laughs> until the return of Christ. I'll tell you what, it gets worse and worse and worse from this point on. But here we are in the book of Matthew chapter 18. And it's important that we look at how we treat people and how we operate with people. Because I'll be real, I want to operate in the blessing of God. On one hand, I do like to know that my, my needs are being taken care of. And, but on the, the biggest thing is I really know that God cares about people. Yes. And part of the key to being a blessing, he says, you are blessed that you would be a blessing. And so here we are in Matthew chapter 18 and verse 6. Amen. When some of y'all get there. Amen. Wrong one. Matthew chapter 18 and verse 6, he says, Whoever causes one of these little ones, Jesus, red letters there, whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin, it would be better for him if a millstone were hung around his neck and he were drowned in the depth of the sea. Here's the deal. This is where I'm beginning to talk about. Like, it's not about you. It's not about me. It's, it's, it's about what we can do together. And it's about creating an atmosphere and a culture where people are encountering God at this church, where people are encountering God where you live. And here's the deal. There's going to be times when the enemy is going to push back. There's going to be times when darkness or the evil of your, of, of, of your own heart is going to come up. I tell the story about one time, you know what, I'd been saved for probably almost two years at that point, and I, man, I'd cast demons out, I'd seen he sick people healed and everything. The Lord had used me in all kinds of ways, but, but, but you know, I think of the one time where in front of one guy, just a, a, a foul word comes out, and that's all the brother remembers about me. And the reason I felt so bad about that, because it was, it was part of my testimony. Like that's all that particular brother, he would always love to tell that story. People wouldn't even believe him. But I had to admit that, yeah, actually I did trust one time. And the brother was there and he remembers it. It's, 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 but it's the same thing. It says right here, it says, whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin, it would be better for him if a millstone were hung around his neck and he were drowned in the depth of the sea. How is that the same thing? Because that's what so grieved me. Not that I was busted, because you know what? I had cussed for two years before that. But because I was worried about this man, uh, about him knowing how faithful God was. Knowing how real God was. Knowing how true God was. Knowing what a blessing it was to be holy. Knowing what a blessing it was to speak life and not cursing and death all the time. And I'm thinking about this verse, and this is what I'm talking about. Many people, when they get offended, hurt, fl uh, afflicted, uh, used, manipulated, lied on, cheated on, whatever, right away we want to go defend ourselves. And I preached this one a while back, saying when we let, when we go take our own vengeance, we're robbing God in that instance too. Because the Lord says vengeance is his. But Jesus is saying right here, whoever causes one of the little ones who believe in me to sin. In other words, if you're being a stumbling block, it's not all about you. That's right. 
Yes, in this place, at this point, we're used to sitting in the same chairs, but what about when it gets packed out? What about the season before we have to leave this place, when we're having two or three services? Are you willing to stay through two services, and are you willing to give someone else your seat? Yes, amen. Are you willing to be a blessing? Do you care about life and fruitfulness and multiplication going forward? Or is it just your financial and your comfort and your well-being that you're worried about? Because God's not so much worried about that as he's worried, not worried, but as he's caring about people and about salvation and about people overcoming and about the blood that he shed and this cross that we're supposed to carry. Jesus says, it would be better for him if a millstone were hung around his neck and he were drowned in the depth of the sea. Do you realize what a danger it is to be a stumbling block? Here's the thing. No longer are you just, oh, oh I'm, I'm just lightly blessed or I'm not blessed at all. No, you're actually, there's no unblessed. It's just you go to cursed. And Jesus says it would be better for a millstone hung around the neck, a millstone is a great big stone used in these days. And if it was hung around your neck and it was thrown in the sea, you were going with it. And you weren't getting out. But Jesus says, instead of causing someone to sin, he said, or if, rather, if you cause someone to sin, that it would be better for you to be drowned in the depth of the sea. Let's go to the next verse. The next verse says, Woe to the world because of offenses. For offenses must come, but woe to the man by whom the offense comes. You know what? And here's the deal. I want to I I just shut this down right now because I've met a lot of religious folks and they go around telling people based on this scripture, well, you offended me. So Jesus doesn't love you. And you offended me. And you offended me. Here's the thing. If you're going to go around and just point at who offends you, that's offensive to God. That's not inviting into the kingdom. Because remember, and that's not bringing about the blessing. Because remember, the blessing is about multiplying and being fruitful. Come on, I'm talking tonight. Because the thing is, is this is a trap that some people get into. I see religious people get into that trap. They're like, oh, well, that sister offends me. And they think just because they claim that they were offended, that that frees them from having to act like a woman of God or act like a man of God. And unfortunately, I've probably seen it more in sisters, but brothers are just as guilty. Guilty. You run into a bunch of religious homeboys, Daddy? I, I remember there was two brothers in the homeboy, and they were just declaring offense. Like for a, like a month, they were just like, Brother, you offended me. Like you need to make this. And it, like here's the thing, I was blessed when I was in the home, and so I'd get like off once in a while and stuff. And they would, well, I, I, it's an offense to me that you don't share that. Do it here then. And then for a while I thought I was going to hell because they would always declare that they were offended at me. They, and here's the thing, they were just messed up. They couldn't be happy that a brother was blessed and just say, hey, can I have a pop? But instead they would declare offense and you know, we can't be those religious people. Do any of you know some religious people? Maybe that's why some of us didn't get saved earlier in our life. Because we knew religious people who were offended at everything. Oh, your sin appalls me. You know what? Your sin does make me sick, but I love you. Get over here. Let's pray it out. Amen. Even in the church, come on. Let's give the Lord praise and we're going to give him praise. The next verse, Jesus says, if your hand or foot causes you to sin, cut it off, cast it from you. It is better for you to enter into life lame or maimed rather than having two hands, two feet, to be cast into everlasting fire. In other words, Jesus is more concerned with your soul than your comfort. How many of us are, are, are willing to receive that though? Jesus is more concerned with your soul and your eternal place than with your comfort today. Some people think it's a big deal because I don't have video games in my house. I don't care about that. I care about everybody's eternity. Here's the thing. I don't even have cable in my house. And with just regular network TV, it's hard enough to get my family to, to get into the Word. And I'll tell you what, with network TV, you want me to be truthful? Hard enough to get myself into the Word. Start watching Blue Bloods. I rebuke it in Jesus' name, Ricky. <laughs> Oh, you know what? Here's the thing. I don't need. I don't need more stuff, more junk. I need more of this. Yes, yes. Jesus is more concerned with with. Here's the thing. And then 
with regard to your soul and then with regard to being blessed remember blessed is fruitful and multiplying with regard to being blessed he's more worried about you multiplying Right. You bring in increase. It's not all about you and you being comfortable. And you, here's the thing. I've had people walk up in here, man, they don't smell good. Or I've walked up to people and like, man, you know what? But here's the thing. Jesus is not concerned with my little bit of comfort, my little bit of my it's called your olfactory senses. Jesus ain't concerned with my old concern with my olfactory as much as he's concerned with my salvation, my heart, and this man or woman's salvation and heart. That's how I can wash the feet when it's time to wash the feet, even when they're not nicely prepared for me. Come on. As he speaks of cutting off, he's speaking of a disregard for personal comfort. Here's the deal. And we're like, oh, well, he paid his blood so I could be comfortable. No, he didn't. He shed his blood so your sin would be paid for. And the blood deals with our sin. But it's that cross that deals with us. It's that cross that crucifies the old me. Because here's the thing, in my right mind as, a, as, an, as the old man, you know what? I didn't want to be around dirty people. Oh, don't touch me, don't come by me, don't come, you know what I mean? I, nah, I ain't feeling all that, you know, start. But here's the thing, but that man belongs on the cross. Because that man is more concerned with his own personal comfort than with the salvation, with the eternity of another person. Come on, we've got to start caring. I am telling you that more people are dying today than have ever died before. Someone someone, someone said it today. They said if, if Denver was a guy, he would be a junkie. Do, do you get that? Yeah. We have just legalized, we legalized marijuana. We decriminalized it. Then we legalized it. Now we've got dispensaries, recreational, medical, yeah. whatever. Now the mushrooms are legal. Yeah. They're, they're decriminalized. And here's the thing. When I went to bed on Tuesday night, the, the vote was they were losing. And I, they, they actually said, oh, yeah, this got shut down. I was like, praise God. Woke up Wednesday morning, and it's like, no. Nah. In the middle of the night, they flipped the script. They're not legal, but they are decriminalized, but they're going down a path. They're going somewhere with it. Here's the deal. Our worst drug epidemic is legal drugs at this point. Come on. That's right. They're distributed illegally, but they start off legal. They're manufactured in, in laboratories and, 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 and manufacturing in medical facilities. Yep. It is never going to get better, and we need to start caring about the salvation. Yes. Elias, we need to start caring about the salvation of our loved ones. Here's the deal is I know it's not easy for you. How old are you now? 15. I was 15 one time. <laughs> and you know what? Back then, it was a little bit different. And all I cared about was me. But you know what? God has given you a better heart than I ever had, a better heart than your dad ever had. Right. And you know what? You can care for these around you. And I know it's not easy. But that's why you need to plug in and let God do what he's going to do. And here's the deal. Danny, Steph, they're going to make mistakes. Yeah. We love them and we draw them out of it. But just because you don't get it right one time doesn't mean you stop. You keep pressing and you keep yeah. getting here. For what? He's going to set you free. He's going to bless you. He's going to give you victory. But it's not only for you. It's for everybody. And that's not just his work. That's all of us. Yes. Amen. Lord. Amen. We don't back off. One of the problems is that all we care about is ourselves. 2 Timothy chapter 3 verses, verses 1 through 4 But know this in the last days perilous times will come For men will be lovers of themselves That's what makes this so perilous Is men and women are only lovers of themselves Or what's the next one? Lovers of money Boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents Who's a, par who's a child in here? Yeah, who's a child? Child of God. Child of God. All right. Are you disobedient? I have been. Come on. Look at that. Disobedient to parents. What's another one? Unthankful. Do we know any unthankful? Do we ever see it in me? I do sometimes. Come on. Unholy, unloving, unforgiving, slanders without self-control. 
brutal, despisers of good, traitors, headstrong, haughty, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. This is the moment that we live in. I could probably preach this verse every time until the Lord takes me. Come on. This is where we live and it's getting worse. We are in the last days. Perilous times are upon us. These are the fruits of an uncrucified man. This can even look like someone who, here's the thing, you ever, you know someone that, oh, well, I, you know, I accepted Jesus, and, you know, I'm, I'm good with what I'm doing, and it's getting better for me. And again, it's like that person, but they offend me. This is offensive. Pastor preaches that. I don't like this. They always ask for money. They this. They, here's the thing. You see a person like that that never has no issue to deal with in their heart? They're a dangerous person. Chances are they're lovers of themselves. Chances are they're, 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 they're disob well, they're obviously disobedient to their father in heaven. You know what? If, if you're not if, if you're not going through it, if there's no struggle, that's when you start to worry. Like, 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 like for, you know what? I, I just I, I'm picking on Noriel and, and Elias tonight because the thing is, is sometimes like you guys just have this encounter. And then what bubbles up? You ever been there, Vicente? Like, March of one year, you're like, the Lord's powerfully on you, and then by May of that same year, like, this is a trip. Was that even real? Did that even happen? You're already wanting other things and this and that. Glenn's been through it. Glenn goes through it. I go through it. David, Pastor David goes through it. But you know why there's so much turmoil in our own hearts and our own houses right now? Because we're striving, we're contending, we're fighting to get it right. Amen. Well, who in their right mind wants to go through all this problem? Well, you know what? People in their right mind that want to serve God, people with the mind of Christ want to do this. Amen. Because they realize that that's why all these things come up. Amen. Amen. And then the other part of it is because it's not all about you either. That's right. Like here's the thing. A lot of times we want it to be all about us, and then we want a bunch of stuff for ourselves. The reason that is, is because you were created to leave a legacy. See, the Word of God tells us that when we live a godly life, that we are created to leave an inheritance for our children and our children's children. That's what a legacy is. Not a, it don't even matter if it's money, but something that really can go. And if it's money, praise God, that, that's nothing wrong with that. But it doesn't, it's not just money. See, and that's why we think, well, we need stuff and we need more stuff and it's got to be about me. But the thing is, you were created to be made into Christ's image, to, be, to, to develop the image of Christ in you, and then to be those that would live your life sacrificially for others. Did you hear what I said? Live our lives sacrificially for others. I, as I talk to the parents and stuff, you know, it, here's the thing is, is not so much parents, but married couples. I, I, it's, it's tough sometimes because, especially when you have one that's young in ministry, you have a marriage that's young in ministry. A lot of times the husband who will recognize and want the call of God will be with a wife who's still learning and still growing and still wants that attention and affection. And a lot of times that, that causes a lot of problems. For one, it takes the husband, you know what, to reach out to his wife and be there and make sure he, he brings her along, which is what I've had to learn to do. And I didn't do it right. I didn't do it well all the time, but I've had to learn to do it. But also it takes the wife understanding, you know what, this isn't about me. Husbands love to say, well, you know, you're supposed to submit to me. But you realize how much weight that carries? You realize how delicate this vessel is that is supposed to submit to you? Are you ready to take care of that? Are you ready to cultivate that? So Vicente, Elias, Glenn, and Noriel don't think you're going to get your chick and she's going to have to submit to you? No, first you better realize, you better get a revelation of how important that daughter of God is. And I'll tell you what, when you bring a young woman to me, you do it the right way. You bring a young woman and, and you, you and your parents and this young lady come, I want to remind her, this young man is a son of God. You don't play games with his heart. You don't break him down. 
You don't require things from him that are unjust. Yeah. He, he's not here to serve you. Right. You're here to uplift him. Amen. You care about the call of God on his life? Because I'll tell you what, you do it right, and that's what I'm going to be asking. That's what I'm going to be sharing about. Why? Because we do. We all have value. We all have worth. But we're not called to sit here and dwell on our own value and on our own worth. And what if my parents came to Well, I'm to his parents, and I've been tithing at the church longer than anybody, so I can sit where I want. Get the Trevinos out of my chair. <laughs> and I'll tell them, well, I've been talking to Trevinos more than I've talked to you lately. No, <laughs> no, the thing is, is you know what? We're blessed, again, to be a blessing. Are you seeing this? Am I talking Amen. this in English tonight? Amen. Check this out. Go with me to Romans chapter 14 right now. and we're Actually, go ahead and go to Romans chapter 14. Yeah, go do that. Amen when you get there. I got just about a dozen more scriptures, but you know I preach that fast. Romans chapter 14. Amen. And Paul, the writer of Romans is talking about how important it is to be careful about how you are with another. Like remember I was just telling you about those people that walk around, well, you offend and lately you offended me. And then I could be mad. Well, I, I better shut up. You know what? That woman's been my aunt and been taking care of me. You know, been a blessing to my life. I better honor her. You know what I mean? So that is, you didn't know that's Aunt Lena. Yeah. The one that looks like my dad. Or my dad looks like her. <laughs> <laughs> In the family, come on. You people are a trip, man. You got me all jacked up up here. You look at Joey's kids, they all look like her. Uh, Even Ricky. <laughs> Romans chapter 14 and verse 14, the word of the Lord says this. Paul, the writer says, he says, I know I am convinced by the Lord that there is nothing unclean of itself, but to him who considers anything unclean, it is unclean. Here's what he's talking about, but this translates to many areas of our lives. What he's talking about is eating meat which had been sacrificed to idols. And I, I think I mentioned this the other day also. When meat is sacrificed to idols... Some people who were weak in the faith were like, well, I won't touch that. That's sacrificed to idols. Like I, but Paul, but the writer of Romans is saying, he says, to, he says, I'm convinced by the Lord Jesus that there is nothing unclean of itself. But to him who considers anything to be unclean, to him it is unclean. He's saying, you know what? Some people view that meat as unclean. But there are others who have great faith and they don't care. They, they bleed the blood, they give thanks for the meat, and they eat it. They don't, you know what I mean? It's not a hindrance to them. And so, but he says, he says, yet if your brother, let's go to verse 15. He says, yet if your brother is grieved because of your food, you are no longer walking in love. So, the, so this is to say, let's say, you know, Danny's like, hey, man, you know what? I'm like, I am not, man, I'm under the conviction that the Lord doesn't need me eating pork, and this is not what I need to do. And I'm like, but Danny, I eat pork all the time and this and that and, and let's say me and daddy go to lunch and one day I'm, I'm sitting there and I'm eating pulled pork and daddy's like man and he's like well you know what forget it order me a Bud Light and he's like well pastor don't care about his body why and, and being the temple of the Holy Spirit but I care I don't why should I care about mine here's the thing you, you get what I'm saying he says yet if your brother is grieved that would be an example of daddy being grieved by what is his conviction. But me saying that's not my conviction. And then me saying it's all about me daddy. It's not my conviction. So I don't care. But what this passage teaches us. And the next passages we're going to go to. Is that if I realize this is my brother's conviction. That I'm going to honor. And, and me and my brother are going to go have lunch. And I really love this man. And I'm caring about his walk. You know what? I'm going to honor that. Because look what it says. Yet if your brother is grieved because of your food. You are no longer walking in love. Remember what you, remember what Paul writes in Corinthians thirteen. He says, "Faith, hope, and love abide, but these love is the greatest." See, because of my faith, I can eat whatever. But because of his conviction, he doesn't. So, if I want love, which is the greatest, to abide 
in our relationship and in his walk. If I don't want to be a stumbling block to him, because Jesus just told me that if I'm a stumbling block to him, it'd be better if I be drowning the ocean by a millstone. So if I want to honor that and walk in love with my brother, and I don't know what his convictions are regarding anything, I'm just using an example. You want to take him out to lunch and buy him a pork chop and probably eat it. <laughs> but it says if your brother is grieved because of your food, you are no longer walking in love. In other words, it's like, dude, it ain't my fault your face weak. Pork chops are bomb. That's what that attitude is. And he says, look at what, look at what the writer says. Do not destroy with your food the one for whom Christ died. What about other convictions? What about other things? What about other ways we feel? Do not destroy with your demand to sit in your chair that you've been sitting in for two years. Do not demand, destroy with that demand the person who happens to be sitting there today. Do not destroy with your demand for something or your requirement for something. Do not destroy who? The one for whom Christ died. Whoa, what a trip. Didn't I just say something like that? We don't got to love everybody, only the ones Christ died. We only got to love the ones Christ died for. We don't have to love the ones Christ didn't die for. Look at that. But if you grieve somebody because of your conviction or because of the strength of your faith, you know what? Sometimes it's better just to, to you know what? Humble yourself because remember, you're blessed to be a blessing. Go to 1 Corinthians chapter 8. You can put your finger there in Romans chapter, I'm going to be in Romans chapter 12 when we finish this up. But we're going to go to 1 Corinthians chapter 8 and I'm going to read verses 9 through 12. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 8, amen, most of y'all there, you get mad? I'm ready to read. I'm ready to get this altar tonight. The thing is, 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 you know what? I love what God is doing. I trust God is doing a great work in many of your lives and in this church. But we've got to know that it's not only about me. I'll tell you what. I've been up on this pulpit many times where I do not feel it. I don't feel the love for myself, much less anyone else. But love's not what I feel. It's what I do. I'll get up here and I'll love you and I'll love what God does and you know what I learned to love myself. Mm -hmm. Check this out. It's the same thing he's talking. Paul was talking about the same type of situation with regard to me. But this goes to so many other areas of our life. It says, beware, some, lest somehow this liberty of yours become a stumbling block to those who are weak. In other words, Paul's telling us, he says, you know what, you need to be watchful. Just because you've got great faith and it doesn't hinder you, you need to be watchful. I know there are denominations that use wine for the Lord's Supper or for communion. You know what? That's I don't. Here's the thing. That's between them and God. But I don't agree with it. I will never use wine here. Why? Because some of us come out of that bondage. I I start using wine, and one day, the next thing you know, Sister Lisa's out there again. Then no more scripture Facebook posts. You know what I mean? And he, he, here's the thing. On one hand, we could say, you know what? Well, Paul says it like this. He says, you know what? I'm free to do all things. I'm, I'm, I'm free to do whatever. He says, but not everything's going to profit me. And then he goes on to say, and you know what? And I won't come under the power of anything. I tell that to when people talk to me about smoking. What about when Paul says he won't come under the power of nothing? I'm not under the power of smoking. And why are you jonesing and flipping out if you can't have one, bro? You're under the power of it. Right here, Paul says, he says, but beware less how, less somehow this liberty of yours become a stumbling block to those who are weak. For if anyone sees you who have knowledge eating in an idol's temple, will not the conscience of him who is weak be emboldened to eat those things offered to idols? And Paul, and he's writing, he, he writes it in these, in these scriptures, he says, some of you have faith to eat meat that has been sacrificed to idols. And the thing that he says, he goes, because some of you know that an idol is nothing. He says, some of you have that kind of faith that an idol is nothing. 
He goes, so some of you know that the meat was just sacrificed to nothing, and so it's not a big deal for you to eat it. He says, but there are other people who don't see it the same way. Just by chance, in one situation tonight, everybody close your eyes for just a brief second, even the babies. <laughs> just for one situation in your life, is there a, is there a little chance that you're not seeing it the way everybody sees it or somebody else is seeing it differently. All right, amen. See, and that's what Paul's talking about. He says, you know what? People sacrifice to, to idols, this meat. And, and the reason why this was such a big deal is because meat sacrificed to idols, you could get it on the deal. It was cheap. After it was sacrificed to idols, they would go ahead and sell it on the cheap. Like they had a a butcher shop that was on the cheap and so you could, it, it was the deal bro they would get the best cuts of meat to the idols and then they would be sacrificed and they'd sell it so you could get like prime rate or half price or whatever it is prime dove half price you know whatever it, whatever it was sweet breast of quail half price and so this this was a, the, this was a thing this was an issue and for those that were Christians and they were like, hey, I know how to get blessed. I'm going to go buy half price meat. Please, the blood of Jesus, thank God for it. Sanctify it under this body, Lord. Right? That's me. But then we got Benjamin. He's like, Pastor, it was sacrificed to an idol, though. I just can't bring myself to eat. Well, then get out of here. No, you know what? The word don't say just kick him out. It says, you know what? It tells me to beware. Unless my liberty is a stumbling block to somebody. Beware because my point of view is not the same as their point of view. And what if, check this out, just what if I can sacrifice my own appetite for pork and, and take daddy to lunch and we can eat what, what is good to his conscience. And you know what, what if that builds him up? What if that edifies him? What if that makes him like, no, nah, me, me and Glenn, we're good, man. We've been growing in the things of God. And what if that encourages him? As opposed to me saying, well, sorry for you, bro. I get what I get and you get. No, you know what? The Lord can move when we're willing to humble ourselves. Check this out. Verse 11 says, and because of your knowledge, shall the weak brother perish again for whom Christ died? About. There's a couple brothers in ministry, and, and we've done some things together. We haven't worked together in a, a well over a year, but I, I do. I love the brother deeply, and I don't agree with how the they do some things. They're not necessarily sinful things, but and and, and he, even there was something that was really questionable, and actually he, he ended up making that right. But when that thing came up, I, I really made a brief deal about cutting it off. And, 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 and you know what? I, I actually I took offense to it. And at the end of the day, he ended up changing that thing about him, but we never really reconciled. And there's still some things that I wish they'd be different, but their ministry's not mine. And the one thing I had to realize about him is, you know what? The Lord loves him as a son. Remember I was telling you, like, when the you know, that I would call the children, the men of this church, the young men of this church, I'd tell them that they brought a girl, girl here, Gabriel, a girl here. I would say, this is a man of God. You take care of him. Well, that same thought I had to think about this brother. You know what? This is a man of God. And then I had to think about how many things do I do that aren't lined up, that are based on my own personal conviction, tradition, based on things I've been taught, based on things that I don't know. And I had to think about that because, you know, what? For, for the first couple of months, we didn't, you know, me and the brother never fought. We never bad mouth one another. We just agreed to cut ways. But I did feel a certain way about him and his ministry. And then the Lord defended him to me one night. One night I was praying, convict the Lord, deal with him, get in his mix. And the Lord said, if I be for him, who can stand against him? I shook. I wept and said, I thought you were for me. 
And he and, and he just said, if I stand for my son, who's over there doing my work, who can be against me? Isn't that a trip? Amen. And then I, you know what? Actually, I, I actually at that moment I texted him and and sent him that verse and told him, you know what? I love you very very much, and I want you to know I'm praying for you. I'll be the first to admit, I and and, and I don't think I should have. I, I I don't invite him to do things. He doesn't invite me to do things. I think we're okay like that, and there'll probably be a time we'll do something again. I think we're okay like that. But you know what? I was ready. To, I, I was ready to slander him. I was. I was praying for the Lord to deal with him and convict him. But I had forgotten how much God loves him. And you know what? Like I said, he. he you know, and, and that's that's the thing. It's not all about me. It's not all about you. You know what? If people want to badmouth you and slander you and this and that, you know what? Psh, let them. Because that's all they can do. The Word of God tells us not to fear man, but to fear God who has the power to kill us and send us to hell. Amen. Look at this. What's the next verse? Verse 11. No, it's, it says, And because of your knowledge shall the weak brother perish for whom Christ died. Verse 12 says, But when you thus sin against the brethren and wound their weak conscience, you sin against Christ. I'm going to say this with regards to Christians bashing you. Let them. Smile. If you need to cry, you cry. But you keep walking. Because the devil wins when we just stay in that circle of throwing mud back and forth. I've learned about throwing mud on ministers. 